heard a lot about spiritual growth, but what does that even mean? I've tried to grow spiritually, but that just doesn't seem to work for me. I've kind of given up on that. I go to church every week and try to be a good person. Isn't that enough? I've tried to read through my Bible in a year so many times, but I can never get past the book of Leviticus. I've gone to so many Bible studies, and I've read a ton of books about God, but how do I know my heart is really changing? I want to be different, but I don't really know how to change. Honestly, I'm not even sure I want to change. I guess this is just how I am. I mean, is real, lasting change even possible? Hey, good morning. I uh, hope you're doing well. I uh, want to kind of just take a moment and do a little family business with you. Uh, that is, I know that if you've read your bulletin or uh, kind of been checking things out, next Sunday is a, a pastoral vote time. And some of you don't come from Wesleyan traditions, and so you may come from traditions that, that will cause some angst for you and all that kind of stuff. So I thought I'd just kind of tell you what that is. Um, the members of our church uh, take a vote uh, after I've been through an evaluation with the board, which is the people you elect, and they evaluate me and how we're doing and uh, things that we'd like to work on, how we're doing the vision. And then um, we do the vote, and then after all that happens, then uh, we get to decide, Lisa and I decide, whether this is a place that we still belong, still want to serve, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, so, and, and so that's not really uh, anything that I would cause or any worry about, but I just wanted you to know that that's kind of what happens happens in the Western world, and then it's be done for another four years. Um, there's actually an option where a pastor can just have what they call an extended call, but I personally like the evaluation period. I think it's a good thing for us to talk and to know how each other's doing and how we're feeling, and so that all takes place next Sunday after the 12 o'clock, or after the 11 o'clock service, uh, probably in the chapel where if you're a member, you can come and, uh, and cast your ballot, and if you're not a member and you just want to see how the whole thing happens, that uh, you're more than welcome to come and do that as well. So that's next Sunday uh, after the 11 o'clock service. Um, just a great day for us as far as a live goes today. Um, a lot of neat stuff happening. We're having a, f a group come uh, after... Um, the third service today, uh, Water of Life Church from Greenville, they're coming here. They're primarily uh, an African-American congregation, and we've been meeting with them, um, trying to uh, discern how we can be better at reaching each other. <laughs> and so uh, we've had a couple of dialogues with them, and we actually sent some uh, folks their way to kind of evaluate how they felt as a Caucasian person and a predominantly African-American, and they sent one couple folks our way to, uh, to one of our services to kind of evaluate how they felt in our service, and we're having lunch with them today to kind of process all that together. So you can be in prayer. It's just a neat thing God's doing in our community. They're a great group of folks, and maybe you'll see them kind of wandering in after church, a whole group of folks. We're having dinner, and it's going to be a good time. So a lot of neat stuff going on. Just wanted to make you aware of at least those two things. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the beauty of worship. I thank you for this team and their efforts. And man, the hope, the hope that we have, <clears throat> how, uh, how blessed are we? <laughs> you can take this moment and just pause and think, man, what would life be like if that hope was not there? What would our families be like? What would our jobs be like? What would our disposition be like if there was no hope? And how grateful we are that Alive can gather today and... Um, Proclaim a message, a message of hope. And, uh, and you're the center of that. So we're honored to be in your presence, honored to be with you today. I pray you'd hide me now in your cross, Lord, and the hope that we've just celebrated together would continue to be the central part of all that we do this morning. In your name, amen. <clears throat> we've been doing the Soul Shift series, and uh, this is basically the deal. The basic deal for Soul Shift is, is that we have this opportunity to grow spiritually. Things can actually change at the core of who we are. And so over the last few weeks, we've had this discussion about different areas that we could focus on and ask God to do some work in our hearts and lives. And so one of the first soul shifts we talked about was how we could shift from a life predominantly focused on me to actually a life that focuses on you. Um, Martin Luther said that we all have this heart that is curved inward on itself. And we can all acknowledge that and recognize that. 
but scriptures teach that we can actually lead a life where it's no longer about me being the center, but we can actually lead a life where others become the central part of what we do and how we live. That's something that God can do in us. That's a shift at the soul level that can totally change how we do life, how we see life. And then we went on from there, and the next one we talked about was this change, um, if you will, from slave to child. And, And the idea there that God teaches is, it's not just this whole Christianity thing. It isn't just about people kind of getting in line. It's not about marching in step. That's not what this thing's about. There's so much more to Christianity than just blindly following. In fact, we talked about how following is really this vague term. And, you know, some people follow really close maybe to Jesus, while other people follow way back at the end of the line. And their commitment to Christ is totally different, and yet both would say they're followers. Well, the really cool thing about this whole Christianity business is God actually taught us something different than blind following. He said that you folks that call yourselves Christians in church world, maybe we've missed this over the years. He says, listen, when you call on me, when you, when you want my attention, when you want to have dialogue with me call, me, call me Father. That's what he asked us to call him. And numerous times, it wasn't just like one time in Scripture and so everybody wrote a song about it. This is all plastered throughout Scripture. He says, call me Father. I want you to call me Father. In other words, I want you to think of yourself as my child. And that's one of the soul shifts that we've been talking about and for many in the room. It's the decision, hey, I'm not just blindly doing this. I'm not trying to get my life in order. No, no. I'm trying to put myself under the spell of a loving Heavenly Father's love. That was kind of redundant, but nonetheless, that's what I was trying to say. I just want God to love me, and I want to put myself under that love. And then last week, we talked about this whole thing about how we see the world. Another shift that can change at the soul level. And last week's discussion was everybody in the room really has these two sets of eyes. With one set of eyes, we take place, we, we observe what's happening in visible world. We look around, we see one another, we see how we're dressed, we see what's happening within our kids, we see all this stuff. But God has actually given everybody another set of eyes at the soul level. So we can not only see what is out here, we can actually see what is unseen. In other words, we can begin to discern what God is doing at the spiritual level. So one of the changes that can take place in our lives is that we can move from just seeing to the unseen part of life so that when we're interacting and we're responding, it's not just a matter of me seeing your face and hearing your words, but actually being able to see with my soul how are they doing What's the battle? And when we have things going on in our lives that we don't understand, we can actually see as spiritual people, we can actually see what is unseen, that there is a mighty plan and there's a loving Heavenly Father who's in charge of that plan. No matter the trial, no matter the difficulty, we can all be a part. God is at work and we get to see that. We get to see that as spiritual people. Now, this is a great time for us to pause and say, okay, We've been in the soul shift experience here for about four weeks. Is anything different in me than four weeks ago? Because listen, respectfully, if not, that's on you. That's on you. If you really just want to come and partake and worship and coffee and leave, you can do that. You really can. But as I said to you when this whole thing began, the idea was... All of us would collectively kind of launch forward in our spiritual walk, in our spiritual understanding. And when Tom's done with this whole thing, Tom's a different man. You're a different person. Because we totally said, I'm not coming to have my ears tickled on Sunday morning. I'm not coming to drink free coffee. I'm actually coming because I want to leave different. I want to leave here transformed. I want to leave here more in love with Jesus than I did when I came in. And that's what this whole thing's about. It's not a game. It's not something slick and sexy we're trying to throw together. This is a chance for you to spiritually engage at a level perhaps you never have before. And so we've worked hard to kind of put this whole thing together for you to say, hey, what if, what if we did this? What if we stopped playing games and stopped treating Christianity as costume jewelry that you take on, put off on? What What if we truly did this? 
and allowed and asked God to shift things around at the soul level. I started living me to you. What would that look like? I started seeing myself as God's child, not an employee. And I started understanding there's a spiritual realm, and I can see what's happening in the spiritual realm through what God can do in through me. See, you would be a different person, and that's a big deal, that you would be different. But here's what I want you to also understand. The people you love would be impacted by that as well. The people you're doing life with would be impacted by the change at the soul level. Here's another thing. Let me tell you. What God does with your life will be impacted as well. Because you will open yourself up to things in God with God that you have never seen before. And that's what this whole experience is about. So I just want to say, listen, it's not too late. You can engage here. You can actually be a part of what God is trying to do in your heart, in your life. And we're just giving you the words to talk it through, to talk about it with people you love in your small group and say, well, just grab coffee and find a stranger. Hey, can I talk to you about Soul Shift? And just see what happens. You never know. You may find a good stranger and you can have a great conversation with someone. And to begin engage, engaging because I don't want to waste this life. Do you? You don't want to waste it away. If all it is is about who makes the most and settles the most comfortable, what, what the point is, what's the point in that? So that's kind of what this whole thing is. Today, I want to look at how we're able to actually see the condition of our own soul, because that truly is part of the conversation. Uh, many of us aren't even aware that we have a soul, and we're certainly not aware of the condition of our soul. And so today, I want us to look a little bit at that. Did you know that mirrors actually date back to the first century A.D.? Not only that, but this is the whole, you know, metal covered kind of glass thing, but all the way back to 6000 BC, okay, they had obsidian rock that they would polish so people could see themselves. You think about that. 6000 year BC and all the advancements in technology and comfort of life and all 6000 BC, somebody said, "Hey, I can see myself. <laughs> you know, wouldn't you think there'd be other more pressing issues? But nonetheless, that's what they were able to see because there's this quest, this desire that we have to be able to see ourselves. And so mirrors have entered our world and they've made us all kind of more aware of how we look. Perhaps they've made us more self-conscious. By, by looking in the mirror, we can actually assess ourselves and know, you know, there's some things here that need to change. There's, that's changing. That's graying. That's getting bigger. You know, that's getting smaller. You know, all these different thoughts. Man, you look old. You look rested. You look tired. You know, all these things have entered our picture. And so we use mirrors to determine how things are going on the outside of who we are. You with me so far? And so that's kind of what the whole mirror discussion is. How are things going on the outside? What if there was actually a mirror for the soul? So in other words, where you could actually look in front of something and say, wow, that's how things are going on at the soul level. Wouldn't that be worth your time? Wouldn't that be worth looking into and saying, hey, look at that. I never saw that. What if there's a way to see inside, listen to me, with as much clarity as what we see outside in a mirror. Now, here's the truth. Most of us would be intrigued, but not excited about that prospect. Wouldn't it be kind of cool, though, to have it all settled and say, there's where things are at the soul level. It would be so convenient to look inside and see in me no longer just what you folks see and the persona the persona that we all try to live with but I could look inside and say wow there's selfishness or there's jealousy or there's an impure motivation wouldn't it be kind of neat just to know it to say wow there it is I can see it right there that'd be worth our time well you know actually I wouldn't bring this all to your attention if there wasn't actually such a thing there's actually a couple of ways that we, we, we're able to look at soul stuff. And I just want to warn you that these were going to seem um, maybe somewhat innocuous and may, maybe not as, imp, as significant until you, unless you really mine down. But let me give you an example. Um, for some of us, you know, if you want to know how things are going in your soul, look at the quality of your relationships. 
Look at the people you're doing life with. Look around and say, man, that person's building into me and I'm building into them. That person makes me a better man of faith, woman of faith. That person challenges me to be more than I am. That person challenges me spiritually. Look and see, or look and see, wow, I'm not getting anything from this. These relationships aren't challenging me at all. In fact, we've all kind of settled somewhere. Look at that. Here's another. That's, that's one of the glimpses into your soul, how your soul is doing. There's another one that I've been thinking about lately that I think is so, is so key, and it's how do we corporate worship? You think about it just a moment. When you come into this place and we're worshiping together, are you engaged? Do you think it's kind of here for you to see and observe? Because that's a glimpse into your soul. But when you worship and you're gathering like this, do you understand you are before the throne of God singing about the hope through Jesus Christ? See, when you understand that, your worship, you're seeing your soul. But when you come into a place like this in any setting and we're doing corporate worship and there's no level of engagement, there's no like how long before this can be over, all that kind of, kind of stuff, you are seeing, <clears throat> you're seeing your soul. Now the problem is, with both of these things, if you agree with me so far, this, this is kind of still can be somewhat subjective. Agreed? We could all say, man, you're really good at relationships. Man, worship, I, it was good. You know, I, I like it. I tapped my toe, you know. There's something spiritual took place. It was, it was awesome, you know, kind of thing. But there's actually another mirror to your soul. And it's a little less subjective. And I also want to say it's going to make us a little more uncomfortable. It is a way that we can look at what is going on at the soul level. And you are going to be tempted, listen to me, you will be tempted to start the excuse-making process. And the reason I know that so well about you is I know that so well about me. And I want to warn you, don't do that. Don't allow yourself to start with the excuse process until we've been through the whole thing together. Because this is an opportunity for us to say, that's how my soul is doing. That's how I really am doing. All of us have this in our life, but most of us ignore it. We walk past it every day, and we never pause to actually look at it, or at least pause to consider what it means for our soul. Does this thing reflect the condition of my soul? And despite all the mental gymnastics and excuses that we can all make, the question is, is what we're getting ready to talk about, how my soul is really doing. Don't you want to know what that is? If we could look at one area of our life and think, man, does that show how my soul is really doing? Here's what it is. It's your stuff. It's your stuff. Look around in your life at your stuff, and your stuff is a direct reflection of how your soul is doing. It's the way that we handle possessions, which is why everybody in this room, as we talk about this soul shift experience, we want to look at the soul shift from consumer to steward. That's one of the most incredible transitions and significant um, shiftings that has to take place. And, and your initial response might be that your stuff has nothing to do with your soul. I mean, all we're really talking about are the possessions someone accumulates over a lifetime. All the stuff that's filling your four walls and my four walls and our garages and all that kind of stuff. Is it really important, Tom? Does it really matter? Well, apparently, Jesus, the hope of the world business that we just proclaimed and sang together and worshiped and adored and devoted ourselves, well, apparently, he thought it was pretty important because Jesus knew that our stuff and what we do with our stuff actually reflects our spiritual condition. Now, listen, don't take my words on this. It's far, far too important for you to listen to what I have to say on this. Let's really look at what Jesus has to say. Now, just kind of, if you're reading along in the book, Soul Shift, you read this. Howard Dayton, Dayton says this. 16 of Jesus' 38 parables were concerned with how to handle money and possessions. 16 of Jesus' 38 parables. 
Indeed, Jesus said more about money than any other subject. And then he lists. The Bible offers about 500 verses on prayer, fewer than 500 verses on faith. Get this. But more than 2,350 verses on money, possessions, our stuff. Now, you all would stop attending, but if we are to follow Jesus' teaching plan, 50% of the Sundays of the year, we should talk about our stuff. Isn't that amazing? But culture is telling us we don't talk about stuff, and I understand all that, but Jesus said so much about our wealth and our stuff and our possession. Here's why. Because he wants us to know how critically important our stuff is and how we handle it because it reflects the condition of our souls, of our souls. From the Gospel of Mark, once again, we join the disciples who are traveling along the way. They're following Jesus to a very familiar story. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Again, not asking you to take my opinion on this. I want us to engage what Jesus said, wrestle with it, and then determine, was Jesus right or not? Mark chapter 10, 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Grab the question. Hold on to the question. Because it's the key to understanding this whole passage. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now look, just before we move beyond, this is not a laid back conversation. This is not two guys hanging out at Mojo's or Starbucks having a conversation over coffee in ideal world. Did you notice in the scripture it says the man ran up to Jesus. Jesus is cruising around walking and this man comes bolting out of the bushes, so to speak, and he runs up to Jesus panting out of breath. This is someone who has spent time contemplating, someone who is, has unrest at the soul level because he's been contemplating his own eternity. This is a guy who's had that conversation with himself, and maybe you can relate, about the condition of his soul. And that condition, as he looked at it, as he evaluated where he was, he realized he did not have peace about eternity. He was at a position of deep, deep unrest and passion. And so the rich young ruler man utters this question that I pray will kind of unsettle us today. What must I do, notice the terminology, to inherit, money term, eternal life? Well, Jesus never answers the question straight. And so he answers the question with a question, and he replies to the guy, uh, why do you call me good? Which had nothing to do with the question, at least in everyone else's mind. And then he lists the Ten Commandments, at least part of them. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Verse 19, you know the commandments. The guy's breathing, he's out of breath. <laughs> you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life kind of thing? Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't defraud people. Honor your father and mother. You know what they are. It's interesting that the commandments Jesus shares are actually the second half of the list of the commandments. You ever noticed that before? You know, the first half have to do with God, right, <laughs> and how we relate to God, but the second half have to do with how we relate to each other. And those are the ones Jesus gives to the man. These are all external behavior type stuff. These are kind of what, when we say, what do followers of God believe, it's, it's these things. It's, it's, you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't lie, you know, that kind of stuff. And Jesus is actually setting the guy up here. You know he is. He's setting the guy up for a soul shift opportunity because this young, successful ruler is getting ready to look into the soul using our mirror. And Jesus is teaching that this soul shift is available way beyond this external stuff that we've kind of whittled Christianity down to, way beyond behavior modification and trying to look and smell like Christians. Jesus is saying there's so much deeper. But the man, he's like me and he's like you. He's confident in his external behaviors. And this is what he says. Well, Jesus, you know, I've done all these things since I was a boy. I've always done these things. 
And so I went to church Sunday. We got a Bible at the house somewhere. You know, I even put some money in the plate. You know, I look and smell Christian. I know the songs. I even have a preset on my radio for Christian radio that I listen to every so often. I mean, Jesus, I, I am, I'm a believer. And that's what the guy says. Verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I just want to pause right there because we've been having this discussion for several weeks and I talked to you a couple weeks ago about the Father's love. Hear this. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus isn't smacking the guy upside the head. That's not this conversation. Jesus is moved for, with, com, with compassion. That the actual, this is like the, the, the uh, steroid love. And what I mean by that is this is agape love. This is a huge kind of love. This is the Mac Daddy of all loves, if so to speak, which is really shame that I'm really lacking the ability to express what kind of love that is. But that is the kind of love it is. It's not brotherly love or sexual love. This is love of choice. Jesus looked at him with, this is the love God invented, with agape type love. And I love that he did that because this guy has so much going for him. This guy's rich, he's young, and he's in charge. And yet he's so hungry, and he's so desperate. He wants to have assurance. He wants to have meaning. Have you ever thought that Jesus looks at you that way? As you seek to grow, as we worship him with all that we have, as we wrestle with familiar struggles and successes and failures, have you ever thought that Jesus is looking down on your life with, with love? Agape, God-invented love? Because the Father's heart, your heavenly Father's heart, is longing for you to have what your heart seeks in him. And Jesus can see right past all the defense mechanisms and public personas and right into the soul. And Jesus in this setting doles out a soul diagnosis that we are all privy to in this place, not only for the rich ruler, but for Tom and for each of you. We now have an opportunity to lean in close because Jesus is getting ready to diagnose the soul. Dr. Jesus is in the house. He has defined the condition, and this is what Jesus says. One thing you lack, and I often put my name there sometimes. One thing you lack, Tom. And you know the rest of the story, but pause just a moment. If you were to think about one thing you lacked in soul world, couldn't you come up with a whole lot of things besides the one Jesus did? One thing you lack, Tom, you need, you know, to be more loving. One thing you lack, you need to be more forgiving. One thing you lack, soul condition stuff. Jesus is defining the soul. One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then, he says, you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now, I'll be honest with you. That verse will mess you up. It messes you up because in an age where we're trying to get everybody to follow God, Jesus is telling the condition of a soul, and he says, yes, you can follow me, but it will cost. You go sell everything, everything you have. And don't give it to me, Jesus says. I don't need any money. I got, you know, other things happen. Just give it to the poor. Then, come follow me. Now, I know where you are, at least in your mind, I think I do. Because too often we hear those words and we think, Jesus is saying that everybody has to do that. And so we're all in the room thinking, man, do I got to sell everything I have? That's like, that's like $25 worth of stuff, you know. <laughs> I got a mess of stuff. And, and so we kind of brush past this story a little bit thinking, well, that simply is not realistic. 
That's not going to happen. And so with the meaning of this passage, we kind of just miss the whole importance of the passage. Well, I'm not going to sell everything I have and give to the poor, Tom. That's just freaky. But isn't it true that just as often as we avoid these words, insisting they're meant for only rich people and not for us? I mean, most of us wouldn't define ourselves as rich young rulers. And so we all sit in a room like this and think, man, yeah, those rich people need to sell everything they have and give it to me. <laughs> That's not like a great, great message, Tom. Best one you've ever preached. Isn't that kind of what we think? But none of that has to do with what Jesus is actually teaching. <laughs> The truth is probably somewhere between those two extremes. In fact, the key words in this story are not go sell everything you have and give to the poor, but rather, then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. That's the point. It's not the possessions. Don't get hung up there. The point is commitment to Jesus Christ. Remember the question the rich man asked to begin the whole conversation? What the rich man wants to know is, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? That's the question that Jesus is answering. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? When I look at my soul, what is it I need to do? What is it I need to let you do in me? And the central focus of the story is not, not possessions, but one's quest to find eternal life, eternal peace. Now we're all engaged. Because something you can assume about me and I will assume about you is peace is very important to you. What must I do to have peace? Not just here, but there. And here's what Jesus' point is. Our stuff can become God's competition. Either our accumulation of our stuff or our mindset and desire on more stuff. And you know, in my world, I actually can see this in my life. I can also see it in my, my church, the one I serve. If we just had more stuff, we could reach more people. See, this isn't a story about wealthy people or money and possessions and, and all that kind of stuff. The subject of possessions comes up only because they were preventing the rich man from focusing on the most essential things. In the end, the problem with the rich man wasn't his money, but his whole economy. And respectfully, this is where this talk gets more difficult. Because what Jesus is asking us all to do is change the entire economy. And we are so overwhelmed with an alternative economy. And the soul shift many of you are seeking today is not stuff alone, but the way you view your stuff and the role stuff has played in your personal and professional lives. And truth be told, many of us are living life for stuff. And God says, that's the issue. That's what I want to go after. I want to change the entire way we see that. And then from the way the disciples responded to Jesus, they couldn't understand how possessions could keep a person from entering the kingdom of God. This is what they said. The disciples were amazed at Jesus' words because there's a rich young ruler. He's young, he's rich, he's powerful. Man, Lord, he could buy us all fancy cars. You know, let him come in. He could do all these amazing things. We could use all that he has and we could travel around like in fancy camels and all whatever they can. You know, whatever you do, we could do all kinds of stuff with this guy. So they're amazed at his words, but Jesus says again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, it's a geographic discussion, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, well, who gets in? Who can be saved? Because I don't know anybody who lives like this. 
And the disciples are feeling a little uncertain here. Even though they left everything to follow Jesus, they were still counting and calculating all they had given up. Don't miss this. It's such an incredible nuance. And it's such a refreshingly honest perspective. What relationship, let me ask you this question. What relationship do you have that is thriving where your primary focus is on what you give up or give to that relationship? Did you follow what I just said? None of them. When you're at that point, you're keeping tallies. You're not thriving. And the disciples were keeping tallies. So many people spend their life with this little tally sheet when it comes to God, and they try to keep track of what they've given up for God. Lord, have you seen what I've done for you lately? And it's exactly what Peter says next. Peter says an exact passage. Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. Jesus, you see what I'm doing for you? I've been keeping tabs on this, and we've made such huge sacrifices for you. And it's interesting to hear what Jesus is saying here because he repeats himself three times within three verses. And this is what he says. It's difficult for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says it three times. It's difficult for people that have a lot of stuff to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's difficult for people who have a lot of stuff Now, why would he say that three times? Why would Jesus put so much emphasis on the topic? Well, here's what I want to say. And before you say this doesn't apply to you, pretend like it does apply to you. In the end, the reason it is difficult for me and for you, the rich, to enter the kingdom of heaven is because our stuff can trap us in a different economy than God's economy. And for some of you, the reason you have not experienced a soul shift is you are wasting your entire life accumulating something in the wrong economy. Nobody's walked out yet. Afraid to move, aren't you? Yeah, I know you want to, but I know. Well, here's what, let me just tell you what I mean by these two. The, the end, in the end, you know, I don't want you to think, I'm, we're not anti-stuff. Jesus isn't anti-stuff. That's not what this discussion is. Wealth is not bad. That's not, the problem's not wealth. The problem is the effect of wealth upon one's soul. That's the problem. That's the problem. And it's as we look at these two economies that we define the need for a soul shift in us. Let me give you an example. In the old economy, possessions are outside of our spiritual lives. And that's where many of us were in this, are in this room. In the old economy, you come in and you sit down and you hear about us talking about stuff. You think, man, what does that have to do with my relationship to God? And the answer to that is absolutely everything. Just because we don't talk about it and it's not in vogue in our culture to talk about it doesn't mean Jesus didn't really mean that stuff. In the old economy, kind of our natural soul state, it does not connect our relationship to the Father and our stuff. But in God's economy, possessions reveal what is important to us, which is why you can go home, right? You can go home today. And you can crack open your checkbook, bring it up online or however you do it, and start looking at what you've spent your money on in the past year, and you will see the condition of your soul. You will. You won't like that, I promise. I know, I know, you're not going to like it. But you will see what you are living for. You will see it. And Jesus knew that. That's why he wanted us to know. That's why he shared this story with us. So people in God's economy take this different path and they use their stuff for God's work, for souls to come to God. And this is that soul shift from consumer to steward. Jesus said it this way, in another place, another conversation, another teaching, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Listen, guys, where your stuff is, as beautiful as you are, Jesus said, where your stuff is, 
That's where your heart is too. In the final day, God judges the condition of our soul and the things that we value. And Jesus is saying, wealth has the potential of shifting our reliance from God to ourselves. In the old economy, possessions are owned. In God's economy, we all understand that we don't own anything. We are just stewarding what God has given to us. Your money's not your money. You are living a dream. When you die, do you take it with you? No, you do not. It will go to someone else. You are really working for someone else. Your entire life. Isn't that encouraging? Aren't you glad you came? And I don't even have donuts for you today. I mean, I did nothing. It's just a depressing thought. Isn't that something? We're just stewarding what God has given us using our stuff. In the old economy, giving up our possessions is a risk. But in God's economy, giving up our possessions is actually an upgrade, according to this story. And you think giving up everything's hard? Try following Jesus while holding on to everything. That's even harder. Keep in mind, Jesus is looking at this from a position of love for the young man. It's not that he wants this man to be miserable. He actually wants the guy to be free. He wants the guy to have a shift at the soul level from just consuming to being a steward of what he has. Stop worrying and fretting about stuff. Stop finding identity in your stuff. Stop trying to build a soul on stuff and stuff. So, what are we supposed, supposed to do? <laughs> you know, we're supposed to go home now and have a yard sale? Maybe. Maybe. Whatever it takes for your stuff to stop running your life. Now, there are a couple things that I just want to encourage you to consider this week. Every week at the end of the Soul Shift discussion, I've said, hey, if you want to apply this, if you want to peanut butter your bread here, this is what you do. This, this is what you do. So this week, this is my challenge to you. First thing is this. As Christian people, practice disciplined giving. Practice disciplined giving. We should be the most generous people on the planet. Let me rephrase this. You people should be the most generous people in central Clemson area. You people should. Why? Because it's what Jesus taught. And if you really are a believer, be a believer. Be generous with your stuff. Be painfully, ignorantly, stupidly generous with what you have. In our home, we find it's best to practice a disciplined giving. We believe the Bible teaches a tithe. It teaches a tithe. It teaches a tithe. You have decided at one point or another that that tithe is no longer relevant to you or it is relevant to you. You've decided that. And so for our home, one of the ways we keep possessions, stuff from being our God is the beginning of the month, the money comes off and it goes 10%. Now, some of you say, Tom, 10% without my income, that'd be, and I understand that. And I wouldn't say, start where you can, but start a regular disciplined giving. Start it. And then at the point now where Lisa and I are actually able to have our tithe come to our church, which is what we believe that the Bible teaches, but we can actually start being generous to other things that we love and support with our stuff. Are y'all following me? See we could have a bigger house. We really could. And I've got to be honest, there are times I'd like to, you know, three kids. You'd like to have a big house. You know, let's build a gym. I'll have my own place out back in a tree or something. You know, whatever. I want to have my own place. And I'm, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But there's more joy in not letting that have my life and my soul. And so that's one. And that's probably the one you expect. Here's the one you probably don't expect. This week. If you're interested in allowing God to move you from consumer to steward, get the whole family together. If you don't have family, get your small group. This would really be awkward. (laughs) It'd probably cause a fight. But get the whole thing together and do a generosity walk. Okay, you didn't get the idea. Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. Walk around your place as a family. 
walk around your stuff. We could do without that. Yes, I'm talking about that. That's crazy, I know. We don't need that. We got 14 of those. And I'm not talking about your kids. You can't give kids away. That's not appropriate. That's wrong. That's bad. That's not, kids are not stuff. Look at all these shoes we got. I've only got two legs. And in our house, it's not Lisa that has the most shoes. I just want you to know. So, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm putting that one on me. Look at all these clothes. Look, just do it. Okay? It would be an experiment. Do it with your kids. They're learning the same thing you are today. So put everybody in the house and say, okay, we're going to do a generosity walk. And they're going to be pumped. They're going to head right for your room. You head for their room. <laughs> Go sell everything you have. Those are two things. Practice discipline living and then try a generosity walk. See what you do. Tell me if you do that. I'd, I'd love to hear the stories. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had a lot of stuff. And through the Gospels, we've all been given this beautiful picture of the battle at the soul level, which is where we've all been over the last four weeks. We've all been invited to look into the soul mirror, just like today. And stuff is not just this man's battle, but it's also my battle, and it's your battle. And all of us have sat in a room like this one and been challenged by a message or moved by the Holy Spirit to respond. And all of us have known at certain times that God was asking something of us. For some, it was a calling. For others, it was a relationship that was not honoring to God. For others, it was a behavior where we knew it wasn't right. We have known what to do. But we elected not to. And this is exactly where everybody in this room is right now. And just like the rich young ruler, we now choose to walk and ignore the call to a deeper, more intimate relationship with God. We now choose to settle instead of gain. We now choose to compromise instead of thrive. We now choose to walk away instead of engage more fully. Or we can choose for a soul shift to take place right now, in this place, in your home, right now. You can make that choice. Me to you, slave to child, Seen to unseen, consumer to steward. Don't walk away. Don't walk away. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the challenge of your word. I'd never have this discussion with these folks if it wasn't for your word. And I am tremendously challenged by it. We're all fully aware in our honest evaluations that our stuff, lack of stuff or accumulation of stuff, has become the central reason for why we live. Everybody in the room can acknowledge that. Some of us acknowledge it professionally. It's all about stuff, getting more stuff. What an empty way for us to live. My prayer, Lord, is that we would invite you into our stuff we would boldly, courageously look into the mirror of our souls and ask for a sincere evaluation. Maybe some of us head home today and get the checkbook out and look at it. Maybe we would do the walk around as the house and our kids will challenge us to points of discomfort and we'll challenge them, but we'll, we'll do it because we don't want to walk away. We don't want to walk away. We know there's truth. We know there's meaning and purpose in this whole Jesus thing. We don't want to walk away unchanged. So as the pastor of this church, more importantly as a brother to everybody in this room, we want to operate, I want to operate in your economy. I don't want stuff to be what I live a life for. 
Holy Spirit, work now. All around the room, corner to corner. Practice discipline giving. Do a generosity walk in your name.